again. Uh, Merry Halloween. Happy Welcome Halloween. Welcome to the live Halloween episode. We are, we are out here in the streets of West Virginia for today's episode. I do not want to let this very important detail, two very important details Ooh. go by. I'll start with the fun one first. We are dressed this year. Yeah. Can you guys tell in the comments? You know, it'll be delayed, so... Uh, in the comments, try and see if you can guess who we are. I'm kind of the team first. version of my character. Well, it's okay, Shaun right. of the Dead. Yeah, I even got like it. I don't know how well you can see it on the stream, but it like officially says like what does it say? Fours Electronics. Yeah, like it's like Hello, you my know, name is Sean. It's the real thing. What happened to our sign? Oh, what are you talking about, Stephanie? Oh, uh, well, oh. it just didn't happen. I couldn't get it on there. You can hold it up, like you can be like uh, <laughs> Matt. Who's that again? John Cusack, <laughs> and and do that. This the the second thing. The second thing is that I am very sick. <laughs> I have a lot of different medications and Zycam and pills pain. and and things going through my body right now because I was coughing a lung and I was congested, and I'm gonna do my best. To read my notes, but I'm very excited. Yeah, this is a once a year. We are in West Virginia. It's going to be a lot of fun. And if, you know what? This is let's do it properly. I want to give the Patreon shout outs up the, front for the patrons that have joined last week. We got Uncle Eli, neither of our uncles, but <laughs> and Uncle or, Eli, or July, uh, Julia, Alyssa, and Taz. I, I am going to sound a little more masculine this episode because my voice will be a little deeper. <laughs> I felt so bad for him. I was like, he comes into the studio we met up and he goes, hi, I was like, are you good? He's like, I'm six. <laughs> that, well, yes, that is true. It is. So my voice will be a little deeper. Um, but, and you know what? Sometimes the best things happen in an altered state of mind. We leave that from believing the booze are, but I don't want, let's not drag this out any further. Charlie, why are we in West Virginia? We went to see one of the most haunted locations in America. We went to the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. We toured it earlier today. A very VIP, believe in the bizarre <laughs> only tour. Not with like 40 <laughs> other people that we no, don't know. Not at all. Uh, <laughs> just introduce me to the Cornetto trilogy. Oh, uh, that's I, the yeah. name. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So maybe next year we'll do the the one you really like. Hot, Hot fuzz. fuzz. Hot fuzz. We'll be cops. I feel like we just kind of look like I listen, I even shaved a goatee. Yeah. I've I never mine down. I I've never had a goatee in my life until today and yesterday. I think it looks good on. Me. I uh, yeah, I, I didn't did. shave all the way down. I was like I can't I can't do it. I'm not doing it. But I did come down a little bit, so. So, sources for today's episode include Legends of America, Vertag, Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum website, USA Ghost Adventures, The Road Untraveled, Mysterious Universe, Washingtonian, America's Most Haunted, Spartan Shield, our friend Audrey, thank you, Audrey, Travel Channel, and Reddit. So, uh, with that said, everyone picture this, a massive gothic structure stretching nearly a quarter mile long with almost a thousand windows, that's a fact, staring out like hollow eyes and walls thick enough to muffle the deepest of screams. And that is the trans Allegheny uh, Lunatic, Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. I will be, I will mess up. I will mess up things that I say just because that's that's how a live show works. Fun fact. Well, it's also, you know, when you're tripping billies. Uh, fun <laughs> fact is allegedly the largest hand cut stone masonry building in North America. I, and I say allegedly because I don't know that to be a fact. That's just that's what I heard. And hello. Measuring. Hello, all the people that are saying hello. Hello. Um, uh, n- we, we did not see Ruth. We didn't we, see we're going to mention Ruth today, but we did not see Ruth. Oh, yeah. We didn't see her. Did you see her? I didn't, no, I didn't see. I saw anybody. Parker. I saw, yeah, Matt. I saw Matt. Our friends. So the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, it's a place where history, tragedy, hope collide in the beautiful, very beautiful rolling hills of West Virginia and ghosts. Certainly ghosts, because if there weren't ghosts, we wouldn't be talking about it on this podcast. So the asylum, with its 242,000 square feet spread across four floors, wasn't built to be imposing or creepy or anything like that. It was actually designed to heal people. It, it had, honestly, the best of intentions, as, as most things hopefully do. And so let's get into what I know will be Charlie's favorite part of this episode. Let's get into the history. I'm so excited. I, this was my favorite class, honestly. I would always go to history class with a little, having my step. Unless it was that one teacher from that one year, but. Yeah. Also, if if this is like, now this might sound like something that you would say to call nerves or expectations. Like, you know, if a musician goes up on stage and they're like, oh, I hurt my wrist or like, oh, my voice isn't that great. And, <laughs> you know, to kind of temper expectations. I kind of told Charlie not to be as funny 
because laughing is is the most likely thing to cause a, a coughing fit. Because earlier today, I'm like, I actually feel okay. And I laughed and it hurt. And then there was like five minutes of coughing. Yeah. So if this isn't the funniest episode I applauded, shout out to Amazon for this thing too. That, that Sam, you've had, we've had it Sam for a while. Yeah, but I haven't shouted it out yet. I guess that's true. So there's a lot of background information. I try to make it a little bit more brief than it could be because... I'm assuming most of you aren't here to hear about the history of the place well, and more well, about some that. of us. Well, are. well, and you're going to get that, but I, I, you know, I, I tight, tightened it up. So before places like Trans Allegheny, mental illness treatment was barely treated, and honestly, I would say treated is a very loose word. The early colonists thought that people with mental illnesses were possessed by demons or witches. So naturally, you might think about Salem witch trials. If you were lucky enough. To avoid being accused of witchcraft, you might end up chained to a wall in a prison, stripped naked, and left to wallow in your own filth. Jeez. And if you're, quote, lucky enough to have family, uh, they might just hide you in the attic to or dig a hole in the ground. It's a lot of fun. But then came the 1800s, a century which we can all agree was very compassionate. Very, <laughs> very, very loving. Friendly. Okay, that's a joke. But. Let's introduce Dorothy Dix. So despite having an alcoholic father and an unstable mother, Dorothy became a teacher at 15 years old and de- dedicated her life to changing how America treated uh, its mentally ill. 15? 15. I, how long did it take you to become a teacher? If, when, I was in, when I was 15, I was, I was definitely not thinking about that. You were that. playing Pokemon. I was red, playing green, Pokemon. Blue, red, that's what orange. I was doing. In 1841, Dorothy visited a jail in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And basically what she saw there, mentally ill people chained naked to the walls, lit a fire inside of her, and that would change everything. So thanks to this crusade, states started funding better facilities. And that's really where this story begins, because in the early 1850s, West Virginia allocated $125,000 to build what would become the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. How much did you say it was? 125000 125, So hey, it's 125 bad. Zero, zero. Back then, though. It was 1850s? Of, yeah, it was yo, a lot of money back then. Yeah, I, it's a lot of money now, too. Let's no, not. No, no, but for, for sure. a building. I mean, we saw, like, yeah. I was kind of curious because, so we did go there today. I wanted us to have a chance to go there and explore. I didn't know if it'd be like a mile away you'd see it. Uh-huh. It kind of creeps up on you. Well, it's because, like, the woods, like, kind of hide it. They're having an event there right now. Yeah, a big event there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you could see, like, the trees and everything around it. But you kind of you got close to it before you were like, oh, there it is. But yeah. Once you park, it is. It reminds me a lot of the Mansfield Reformatory. Not, yeah. I mean, prison versus mental asylum. I wonder if you come up on the other way from it. I don't know. The way we came up, we almost didn't even see it. Hope you give us a detailed floor plan. Ha! <laughs> 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 yeah. <Yeah>. No. <laughs> so let's talk about Thomas Kirkbride, a Quaker farmer's son who had revolutionized mental health care architecture. Kirkbride was dedicated to designing a building that would encourage healing. In fact, he had the asylum design in its shape to make sure that every patient would get therapeutic sunlight and fresh air. The asylum was intended to have over 900 windows to help flood all of the halls with light. And I mean, well, I personally like darkness. I, well, I vibe the best in darkness. I think sunlight helps. A lot of people say mental more, health, too. Yeah, well, I mean, not and not even like even if you're just stressed or you're having a bad day, you know, people say go walk in nature, go get some sunlight and it'll make you feel better. Mm-hmm. So I think it's cool. So we're talking about two people right now, Dorothy and Kirk Bride, that are both coming into this with very positive intentions. Like, let's build something where we can help mentally ill people. And then Kirk Bride's like, okay, I'm going to build it so that it's spacious, yeah. it's comfortable, there's all this light, you know, to promote healing. And, and when you were when we were there, I did, it, there were a lot of light. It was like a lot of open. A lot of windows in yeah, space. It it's nice. very spacious. It's, it is absolutely huge. So the early days of the asylum were regarded as wonderful. The asylum had its own farm and dairy, so patients were actually treated to really nutritious food, high-quality food. Here's a quote from a patient around that time. Quote, the Thanksgiving thing thing was great. (laughs) We had great turkeys, and the Christmas thing was wonderful. It was like a fairy tale atmosphere. It's like, I must be in heaven. I'm not in in a nut house. I'm in heaven. Unquote. But as expected, uh, there is a unfortunate pivot coming in the nature of the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. And that's the Civil War. Suddenly, this peaceful, helpful asylum became Camp Taylor, or Camp Tyler, which I take no... That's your name! I don't, I take no, take nothing from... Which, by the way, I know you're monitoring the chat as yeah. I'm going through this. Mm-hmm. At any time, if anything interesting, or if anything comes up, feel free to, you know, cut do, me well, off. Do you mind if I 
Let's talk about this one thing. Oh yeah, talk about this one thing. So someone said before this was, the asylum was a, a tourist attraction. Their father snuck into it. Like they they broke in, and I can't even imagine that'd be so scary. Um, why'd they break in? I don't know. I think probably just to see what's going on. Well, nope, there's a lot of windows. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Anyway, keep, continue about Tyler. So Camp Tyler. Uh, military post. So Union soldiers marching at dawn, June 30th, 1861, made a beeline for the local bank, seizing 27,000 in gold, which was meant for the asylum's construction, uh, which would have supposedly been over half a million today, wow. which I, I, that's what they said. I, I'm, so I, I'm not a converter of, you know, time money, but so everything became really chaotic during the war. And by the time it was over, everything was a mess. For one thing, one of the biggest issues with the asylum was overcrowding. So while the asylum is huge, it was really only intended for about 250 to 300 patients. But after the Civil War happened, it was now holding over 2,500 people. So it's a lot more. It was jam packed. There was high tension. There was bed sharing rules. Like you were like given a bed for eight hours. And as soon as that eight hours up was up, it's like, all right, you're out. Somebody else is going in. Oh, my God. Um, Although if you're second, you got a warm bed. <laughs> well, would you want seconds on a bed? No, because we found out a lot about the patients today. So, no. Yeah, yeah. We And I'll, I'll give you a chance to talk about that because you are experienced at least some of it now. Yeah. And I'm not covering all of that in the notes. So, yeah. I'll be excited to know some of your thoughts on that. So why did the asylum become overcrowded? A big contributing factor to the increase in patients is you didn't really need to be mentally ill to be accepted at the asylum any longer. Uh, you could have tuberculosis, mm-hmm. you could have asthma, and we're at a point in time where if if it's uh, a wife that doesn't behave, doesn't listen to the husband, the husband can just send you there. Send her away. Send her away. And also, tragically, what we learned today, which isn't in my notes, was that... Uh, Parents treated the trans Allegheny like Lunatic Asylum like yeah. an orphanage where it's mm-hmm. if uh, if you have a child, maybe the child has autism or maybe it's just a child you don't feel mm-hmm. you don't you know, don't want it doesn't like bedtime. You people were just dropping because we went to like a toddler section today through the tour and it's a just, toddler section. It's just really, really, really sad. That hit me. Hit me very hard. Yeah. Well, yeah. So it's this is like so far from what Dorothy and Kirkbride envisioned. It went from this beautiful healing place to now it's overcrowded. Uh, you have a mixture of very, very mentally ill people m- mixed with people that were just kind of dumped there all together. So now is when you get into the treatments and that's kind of when extra diabolical and creepy things come into play. So let me let me say this. Oh, can I ask? Really yeah, go ahead. Someone said uh, it was this free housing. Like was it was it free to the patients? I don't know. I don't know cost. Okay, I have no idea. I would assume if people were dumped there, the people that did the dumping weren't charging. Right. And we were told today that there was an alcoholic ward, and people were given fifty dollars if they brought an al- alcoholic to yeah it was to the side. bounty hunting. So you were, maybe you were getting paid to drop people off there. Like we were joking, people were just waiting outside bars and rounding them up after they were done. So I, I don't know how often this is talked about on the podcast. I I don't consider myself a very squeamish person. Um, I haven't. I've been lucky enough to not really be in contact with too much gore in real life, but watching like horror movies and things like that, Terrifier, Saw, it doesn't get to me too bad. You know, I'll be like, ugh. But one thing that gets to me and always has is lobotomies. Lobotomies are, it's just like there's certain things that don't work, but when they don't work, you can be like, well, I see what they were trying to do. Yeah. Or I could see why they tried that or yeah. what they were going for. Lumbotomies, the idea of, and just to clarify for people that might not know, is you take a pick and you enter it through the eye. This is for people that were mentally unstable. And by mentally unstable, I mean family or friends that thought you were mentally unstable. And maybe some were, some weren't. And they put the pick in through the eye. And jammed it around because they were trying to mess with your frontal lobe. Change your personality. And and yeah, and they're like, well, you're just a little aggressive, you know, yeah. you're having issues, you're not listening to your husband. So we're just gonna scramble your brain like my favorite egg dish and pull it out. And then you basically became like a numb zombie. Oh, two things about that. So we heard a story today about a, a boy who was twelve years old. We got this this procedure done. Yes. And because he was so young when it happened, his frontal lobe actually healed. 
you'll yeah, be able to heal from it. Because you don't your your brain doesn't fully develop until you're in your twenties. So he was able to recover and, and he didn't even know that he had a lobotomy until his fifties. And he's still alive today. He's in yeah. his seventies. And then Todd was on the phone uh, when we went through the museum with the part with the uh, lobotomy, and he didn't. He walked in the room. He didn't see it. And I was like, Tyler, look. And he did this dance move when he saw it. He was down. What it looked like? Whoa. Oh, like a full body. <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's lobotomies. Like are just. I I hate to say evil because uh. I want to believe that there was good intentions. It's just like. I understand how it works, but I still don't like the fact of putting a pick like a metal rod mm-hmm. through here. Like it just doesn't fit. Like, I just don't know. It doesn't fit. Like it's just. So here's a quote from the road unraveled quote of the medical treatments used at the trans Allegheny lunatic asylum. Lombotomies intrigued a group the most. Lombotomies were regularly used to treat mental disorders because they interrupted the neural connections in the brain's prefrontal cortex, which ultimately stole the patient's personality and left them without effect. Patients at the asylum underwent transorbital lobotomies, crudely known as ice pick lobotomies, which involved the insertion of an ice pick-like instrument into the eye socket until it connected with brain tissue. So Dr. Walter Freeman popularized the procedure and brought it to the trans Allegheny lunatic asylum when he conducted lobotomies for $25 per patient and encouraged crowds to watch as if it was a theatrical presentation. Almost all patients who underwent the procedure were completely altered, often unable to provide even basic self-care and many died during the lobotomy. How do you, how do you die during the lobotomy? Does it just go too it far? Pro- maybe it just goes too far. You're just like, bang, oh shit. Yeah, you know, and they're like, uh, I don't know, natural death. Last where we let off, we're talking about Walter Freeman, who was uh, charging twenty five dollars for lobotomies, and that isn't all. There was insulin shock therapy, electroshock treatment, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of malpractice, and like I said, it was overcrowded and tensions were running high. Shoot, twenty five for a lobotomy? Twenty five for a lobotomy? That's not so bad. You got an, uh, a wife you're not happy with. You got a child that doesn't want to eat their dinner. Bring them in there, scramble their brain. Oh God. Okay. <laughs> well, it's just like uh, the Kennedy Rose. I think it's Rose Kennedy. Yes, I was. I was telling Parker about that. Uh, it's terrible about what happened. That about what happened. It's, hap- it's terrible. What happened to all of them? Yes. So. In 1994, the asylum couldn't keep going. The building was crumbling. The practices were clearly outdated, and it was a natural breeding ground for trauma and negative energy and experiences. Today, the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum stands as a testament to know how far we've come with mental health, you know, a, a glimpse in the past so that we don't make the same mistakes. Obviously, there's still a lot of improvement we can do, but it's also cool because you can do tours. We did a tour. They, they have history tours, mm-hmm. Civil War tours, paranormal tours. You can stay there overnight and go sun. Yeah. So, and, and they've renovated it. They've done a really good job of keeping it renovated without removing the, the uh, you know, the actual natural feel of the place. Yes. It's really cool because you saw the doctor's area too. And the yeah. Tour. That was beautiful. So that is the history. I'm going to leave it at that. So I know we talked about it in our post. Uh, we have three trivia questions tonight. You answer the trivia question by typing the exact correct answer, correct answer in the chat. And we are giving away for this question, for question one, a BTB mug, question two, a BTB t-shirt, and for question three, a BTB hoodie. Yeah. So it's that season. You guys, you guys can't play though. I'm sorry. (laughs) But if you want something, let us know. If the chat is ready, I'm going to, well, do you need this or you got it in your head? Uh, no, I need to see that. Okay. I'm going to pass the mic over to Charlie. The first correct answer in the chat. And please like email us. I believe in the bizarre at gmail.com or hit us up on Instagram or Facebook or mostly just Instagram and let us know like, Hey, I'm so-and-so who won so we can get your shipping address. All right. You ready to watch the chat? Ready to watch the chat? Uh, you were listening to Iris. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> That's not it this time. Uh, it's really funny. But and we need we need specifics for yes. this one. Uh, so this is trivia question number one to win a BTB mug. All right. So in the Rutenberg Cannibal episode, we did that fun back and forth. Tyler asked me if if Charlie, if you had to eat a human body part, forearm, 
specifically the forearm. What seasoning would you use for this? And what do we both agree on? Yeah, what seasoning did Charlie and I both say we would use if we had to eat human flesh? A little bit more specific. A little more specific. No, No, not garlic salt. Not garlic salt. Yep. Yeah. Hunky chunk one. Got it. Garlic powder. Garlic powder. Garlic powder. Because there's enough salt already. I'm glad that you guys remember that. Do you guys remember? Wait, did you guys remember that? Or did that just make sense? Like, did you guys think <laughs> if I were if I were going to eat an arm? Someone said bay leaf. <laughs> <laughs> bay leaf is actually what made me think of this question. It's I'm like, true. How could I incorporate? But bay leaf was too easy. But I appreciate, I appreciate the bay leaf. So hunky chunk, a hunky chunk message us. And um, we had to go back to the episode and listen. Yeah, we did. I, I we thought it was garlic. Yeah, I would say garlic. Yeah, I pr- I appreciate that you guys remembered. Yeah, thank you. All right, so that is the history. Let's move on to some of the famous ghosts and locations in the asylum. All right, the back room, and we're not talking about the back rooms. <laughs> this would Different. be not more entertaining if it was the back rooms, but. If we, if we, was it called clip? If we clipped into a back room today during that tour, yeah. that'd be so trippy. Can you imagine how terrible the, mo- the monsters that would live in that? Imagine you, you clip into the back rooms of the asylum and you go back in time. <sighs> oh, oh uh, I don't like that. So the back room in D, not to be confused. Oh, I already said that. So allegedly in a room towards the back of one wing, a patient named Dean was brutally murdered by two other patients. Initially, they tried to hang him. But when that failed, they uh, placed his head under a bed frame and they jumped on it over and 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 over until the bed frame was touching the floor. Oh, my God. Pretty graphic and tragic. So now they say that room is haunted by the individual. It's known for cold spots and quiet cries. Isolation cells. This is kind of a story about the cells in general. Uh, The staff of the asylum were given pretty much free reign to send any patient that they thought was being a little unruly and chaotic into an isolation cell, which the discretion was completely up to the staff who were overworked and outnumbered by the patients. So apparently patients would do just about anything to avoid going into these cells and do anything to get out of them. In one instance, apparently, allegedly, there was a former boxer who had severe head-like injuries leading him to be very aggressive, which I would assume we would say today is probably CTE. Probably. Uh, He actually ripped one of the metal doors off the isolation uh, cell, walked out, and then like calmly handed it to one of the nurse and then (laughs) just walked away. How strong is he? Very. Is this the Hulk? No. It said that these rooms carry a very dark, violent energy, and visitors report being scratched and pushed, along with voices saying, get me out of here. The kitchen! Everyone ends up at the kitchen and the parties. Love kitchen. So there's no specific ghost or background story associated with the kitchen, but folks claim to feel that they are constantly being watched in the kitchen, and others report feeling dread. So another main infected character is called Slewfoot. We call him we call him a special infected. I don't know if anyone's ever played Left 4 Dead, but whenever we talk about a haunted location and there's like, oh, you're gonna see Bobby, like we did the Waverly Hills Sanatorium, we just call him special infected. So if, if that slips, that's why. <laughs> so Slewfoot, here's a quote from Spartan Shield. Quote No one knows how the man known as Slewfoot got his nickname. Supposedly, he roamed the upper floors and killed and tortured people in the upstairs bathroom. To this day, he haunts the bathroom and the upstairs floor. Charlie, you can speak to this one. Yeah. Frank and Larry. In the, as they called it, the alcoholic ward, there were two buddies, Frank and Larry, who loved playing cards. And they're known as Snap and turn flashlights on and off. It seemed like it was a pretty chill, a pretty chill ward. It did. You know, there was one story that I don't have in my notes, but we heard it today and I found it interesting. In the children's ward from like 11 to 17, there was this 17 year old bully who was like six foot five and he would pick on all of the other patients. That was a crazy story. And there was an 11 year old who he repeatedly picked on and picked on and picked on and it got to the point where the the little 11 year old uh, didn't want to put up with that shit anymore. So he made a makeshift shank, took the shank, followed this 17 year old bully into the bathroom and then stabbed him 17 times. 
One for every year he was born. Yeah. He's like, he probably Let's counted him out loud. One, two, three, four, five. So when he left, uh, the, the guy walked out into the hallway, fell down, and then crawled halfway down the hall, yeah. died right in front of, right before the nurses' Supposedly station. Supposedly two nurses that were there. And the nurses apparently didn't want to get caught up in the fighting, so they didn't come out. That's what they said. They said for safety. Yeah. Which, if that's true, that is very disheartening. Disheartening, but he was a bully. The next one is the creeper. This is a shadowy torso who doesn't have legs and slithers around the ground like a snake. There's not much known about this entity, and nobody really has anything bad to say about them. Like, he doesn't harm people. But I imagine the visual of seeing this sliding, snaky torso. That's so terrible. be very scary. Do you think... Okay, I just just want to ask you about that. Yeah. Do you think that that is a person that got their limbs taken. Maybe. I, I have no haunting. idea. Like, I, I, I'm just asking, like, would you, because that's my idea of like, why that would be there. Or do you think it's something else? I, I don't think it's something else. I think it's somebody from there. Now, I, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know what, what's going on with the legs, but it would be very, very creepy to see. I, I don't, I think, I think these are human spirits here. Yeah. I don't, I don't think there's anything demonic. I th- I think it was a person. Maybe they didn't have ability to use their legs, and or they were just gone, and they just they just that's all they can do, um, which is sad. The next one is one of the more famous entities, which we didn't hear about on the tour, which is kind of shocking to yeah. me. Yeah, and that's Lily. Uh, so there's two main origin stories for Lily. One is either she was a former patient who spent her entire life there, or she was born to Gladys, a patient who died during childbirth after being assaulted. By Civil War soldiers. Damn. So according to the stories, Lily was cared for by the nursing staff until she died of pneumonia at age nine. Today, her room has been transformed into a shrine painted a cheery yellow and filled with toys, including a distinctive pink and white music box. Visitors and staff regularly report paranormal activity in Lily's room, including toys moving on their own, giggling sounds echoing throughout the halls, and Lily engaging in games of catch with the guests. I yeah. I feel like that was the same girl. Where she said Emily? Yeah. Yeah. I don't well, but no, she said that was hospice. Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. Because she it was she was terminal. Yeah. Right. I like the whole I the whole tour. There was like three things I want to ask the tour guide, but I'm an introvert, so I just kept my mouth shut. Yeah. But I wanted to be like when she's like, Oh, we're about to finish up the tour, I'm like, what about what about Lily? <laughs> I we went in that one room though, there was a ton of stuff. Backtrack. I mean, you mentioned was it Frank and Dean? Frank and Frank and Larry. Frank and Larry. Yeah. Parker had his phone out. I was very much paying attention, and he dropped it in the middle of the tour. It was so loud, and he goes, "Oh, Larry!" <laughs> <laughs> it was a good save. It was a good. It was very. It was fun. about an Ohio State football bet that we lost. <laughs> it's all good. Next one is Ruth. On the first floor, there was a female patient named Ruth. She resided in the Civil War wing with the veterans, and according to her legend, she hated men with an unbelievable rage. To this day, some people say that she will throw things at men if given the chance. And now here's one where I've heard two names in my my research. And today, during the tour, I heard a third name. So we're just going to call him the J guy because I've heard Jim, okay. James, and today his name was Jesse during our tour. Jesse. James Jim Jesse was a patient that allegedly died from a heart attack while upstairs in the bathtub. Mm. He's a spirit that is sometimes seen and heard in the bathroom in various other areas of the asylum. Mm. Nurse Elizabeth. Apparently, there's not a lot known about Nurse Elizabeth. It's said that she went from floor to floor taking the care of the patients in need. No one knows what happened to her, but she roams the halls with other ex-residents of the hospital. Now, we heard a story today about a nurse who... What were the scents? What were the scents, uh, Charlie? Rose and lavender? Rose and lavender, something like that. And she was very kind, and uh, our tour guide said that she doesn't like that people leave gifts, because that's what people do. They go no, on tour. Right? Well, I'm, I'm telling uh, people that people leave gifts. Yes. Cards, yes. toys, cigarettes, things like that. And we were told that the nurse doesn't like that people leave cigarettes, uh, but they do, because <laughs> I, I don't I don't there know. were a lot of cigarettes in the alcoholic wing. There had to be at least fifty dollars worth of one dollar bills. There were a lot around of everywhere. Some coins. I wonder how many people just kind of you know. Like, You'll probably get to this later. But the the part about the teens is word with the fingers. No, that's not. No, that was okay. completely new. Oh, okay. Though she gave us a lot of small, very interesting details. So there, she was talking about um. Shout out Kaylee. 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 She was awesome. She was a great tour guide. Um. 
she told us that the the teens would stand by the windows and watch like baseball games, football games. People allowed to be outside. Yeah, not them. But they were like numbed out on this drug. What's it called? It was like Thorazine. Thorazine. Yeah, they're numbed out. They couldn't yeah. feel anything. That was one of the few things that overlapped information. And uh, she said she, they'd stand by the windows and there were these divots that they carved out with their fingers because in the wood that they could not even feel doing. Yeah, like those, all those lines. Not I don't, sure that I don't know how well you can see. <laughs> well, I'm still doing it. All those lines in there were created by <laughs> fingernails. Okay, made it. Those were created by fingernails while they were tripped out on this numbing medication called Thorazine, which left them personalityless and yeah. just scratching, watching other people play sports. Just the idea they're just like standing there scratching. That's how I feel watching so bets when I can't control the game. <laughs> so, uh, and also there were Civil War soldiers. People report seeing soldiers from the Civil War walk around the halls. Not many like stories about any specific Civil War people. Or, you know, army men or anything like that. It's just, you know, the occasional glimpse here and there. So, those are our main ghosts that haunt the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. So, now we're going to be getting into my favorite part of the podcast, and that is encounters. But before we do, it is time for another trivia question. Yeah. So, the first one was for a mug. This trivia question is for a t-shirt. It'll be our neon logo, Believing the Bizarre t-shirt. Let's get to our second trivia yeah. question, which again, be very specific with your answer. And the winner gets the first, the winner will be whoever says it first in the comments and you get a neon logo t-shirt. All right. So the number two, maybe one of my favorite episodes, where is the Hoyabacha forest located? What country? Hoyabachu. Hoyabachu. Where's the Hoyabachu? forest and you got to tell us if you remembered it or if you googled it <laughs> don't read any books you find in the basement yeah i know well I, it's not that type of a cabin i was thinking about it cabin in the woods meets uh there Evil is a Dead. book in my room i don't know if i showed you is it the bible no it's it got some skin oh well, maybe i got it dm Demi trova Demi. Oh, okay hit us up guys please email us at believe in the bizarre com or instagram dm us Send us a All screenshot right. or whatever. There were a couple that got it too. Yeah. She was just quick. Listen, I would have said Japan too if I didn't remember the episode. Russia was so close. Russia is. Switzerland was close. But it is Romania. So thank you everyone for playing. But don't, you know, make sure you stick around. Even There's if, still another question. Even if, yeah, even if you don't care about this episode or the encounters, you still have a <laughs> chance to win a BTB hoodie. Oh, but I love the encounters. I yes. love them. I saw it in the comments. We're going to get to it. I have I have a treat for you guys. It's not right now. We're going to get to it as any good treat. It comes with time. You do not eat your ice cream before dinner. One of our friends, a real friend, I got to meet her in Colorado, and a podcasting friend. She has a podcast, and she's a longtime listener. She's actually one of our first listeners from 2020. Audrey is a paranormal investigator. I got to actually sit in on one of her investigations. It was awesome. And she has been to the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. So I reached out to her and I was like, hey, if you got time, will you uh, write up your experiences that you had there? And she did. So that's not next. That's a tease. It's a radio tease. You know, it's like, oh, around the break is, you know, but we're not going anywhere. Uh, but that is coming <laughs> up. And I'm very excited for that because it's a legitimate paranormal investigation from someone I know, we know, uh, that was there. But first, let's get to Reddit, the most believable content that exists. <laughs> and this is from Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler on, on the Roof, quote, my little brother and I did one of the overnight lockdowns a couple summers ago. I definitely re recommend taking the history tour during the day as it'll help you get your bearings if you're there at night. The history behind the place is pretty amazing. The guides will explain why architects included so many windows, what rooms were used for, etc. We had to have a lot of luck with dowsing rods as well as pretty basic voice recorders. We got a couple EVPs on the second floor, including a series of heavy breaths when the recorder was left in one of the lockdown cells unattended while we roamed the rest of the hall. The Civil War area has a very negative energy, and we believe that one particular spirit we encountered was causing us to feel physically ill. We left the area, rounded a corner into one of the main hallways, and stopped behind a remaining nurse's station. 
We instantly felt the sickness in our stomach telling us to leave. We used our dowsing rods to communicate with what we thought was the spirit of a doctor who worked in the facility. We indicated through asking questions that he protected people from angry, negative spirits that like to harm people. Probably the most profound experience we had was in a room on either the third or fourth floor, I can't remember. It was one of the rooms that had two open doorways on either end of it, but no solid doors. Using dowsing rods, we believe we contacted a spirit of a 17-year-old boy named Christian. We spent about 40 minutes asking a series of yes or no questions to determine his name. Went through the alphabet, determining the first letter, and then we just started guessing names until they started to cross. We thought the spelling was odd because it started with a K, not a C. But given the time period, the facility was active, and the number of immigrants that lived in the area, there's really no telling. I actually knew a Christian that had it spelled this way, but it was a female. With a K? With a K. K R I S T I A N. My good friend Kat spells her name like a C. Yeah. And that's weird. Uh, the spirit was so responsive. We would ask him to point the rods at a person in the room named X privacy and the rods would point right at person x we would ask it to point the rods at the person wearing glasses and the rods immediately snapped in their direction really incredible stuff we have the night vision video footage of it somewhere at my mom's house somewhere obviously it's always somewhere it's somewhere word of warning before you leave tell the spirits they are not welcome to come home with you mm-hmm. my brother and i were exhausted and freaked out and left as soon as they unlocked the doors neglecting this step we experienced weird things at the house for the rest of summer. My brother had nightmares for two weeks. It might sound cheesy, but it saves you from what we went through. It's worth it. We didn't Unquote. do that. Well, we didn't do a paranormal tour. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we, did. <laughs> we did a paranormal tour. We didn't do ghost hunting. We didn't do overnight We didn't tour. contact any spirits. Now, am I going to go through every single photo on my phone? And... <laughs> oh, this is fun. Our friend, our friend shows this picture from uh, Imager. Of like a natural ghost caught on asylum, and we looked at it and we saw it beforehand. We we're like, "Oh, that's really creepy," and then we went there. And the thing is, we kind of debunked it because if you take the picture, well, let's ex- it, explain what it looked like first. Uh, okay, okay. So it looks like uh, a hallway, and then like a sign, and then you see like this like fleshy kind of head. Like it's like if this is the hallway. Like the where the it breaks to the the corner, you yeah. see kind of like this, like someone's, like like someone's peeking. <laughs> Not sure that'll translate. Well, you know, okay. So imagine someone peeking around the corner of a hallway. Use your vivid imagination, and we're like, "Oh, that's really creepy." So we get down there, and she starts exploring. And pretty early into the tour, she brings us to this one wing, mm-hmm. where I guess this band used this area as like a music video, and the music video had caught this image. And they posted it on a door and they had it laid out uh, in the actual hallway. So there's two places. The thing about the image on the doorway, it lines up with the hallway. And if you take a picture in that hallway, it kind of looks like that exact same picture that we found on Imager. And our friend, he took this picture and he basically recreated it. Yeah, he did the scientific method. Debunked. He re- replicated it. Hopefully it the, is us. Hopefully the video and the audio is good. So this is from Nora Crime Reads. I can feel it. The congestion. I'm sick, but we're going to get push through this. Push it away. Push it away. Quote, when we made the reservation, I expected there would be eight or nine people, newbies like me, ghost curious. In fact, there were closer to 50 in attendance, some profoundly pres- professional looking. After we check in, We watch other groups enter, bearing hard equipment cases, stacks of them bungee together on a dolly, including a group of three that appear to be a mother, father, pubescent kid, in matching t-shirts featuring a variation of the Ghostbusters logo. In a meeting room where we waited to get started, these groups began unpacking and testing their equipment, laser-focused. While I'm hardly expecting a transparent figure roaming halls ahead of us, I realize, watching the other investigators around me, I don't want to experience solely explained via meter readings, temperature fluctuations, bright red lights. I want to see a ghost, whatever that may look like. After everything's been checked in, we're divided into our four groups, 10 to 12, plus a tour guide. Each group will start on one of the asylum four floors, spending two hours investigating and then move to another floor. Our tour guy's name was Ryan, who was an EMT from Tennessee who treks out to volunteer on the weekend. So we start the tour with the top floor. 
The mood's perfect. The sky outside crackles with the coming storm, and at various points in the evening, we'll hear thunder. It's also very hot. Okay. On the upper floor, which it was not for us. It was very cold. It was. I actually really liked it. It was because I was, was still sweating. It was pretty cold. It was pretty cold. On the upper floor, most of the windows are painted shut. The hallways, the individual rooms are stagnant. The only cool air in the lobbyish area in the middle of each floor. Three older women in our group, who I dubbed the Smoke and Grannies, take advantage of these balconies for cigarette breaks. Oh, uh, okay. As the orientation comes to an end, Ryan can perhaps sense a little hesitancy in our group. We are less weighed down with the heavy equipment of the more practice investigators. In addition to the Smoke and Grannies, there's another couple, similar in age to my husband and I, a few teenage looking girls and two teenage looking boys who move as a unit and make me feel, as all teenage boys do, deeply uncool. I agree. This so this is like a, a it's this is an article written on a website by this isn't like a Reddit. This is like someone probably like a journalist's article. Just so you'll hear that language. Ryan suggests that we take a little time to explore on our own and then meet together in one of the hallways for a group session. My husband and I walk away from the others. I'm not sure what I want to do exactly, but I don't want to do it in front of these teenagers. <laughs> we find a room with an old chalkboard that's been scrawled over, but it's clear that the markings are recent, probably from prior ghost hunts. I try a Q&A with my voice recorder, but I feel so awkward, sitting on the floor asking questions to an empty room. Most of the rooms are empty of furniture, though some retain bed frames and the odd chair. Later, I'll understand the secondary purpose of Ryan's tour. Not only does it give us a history of the asylum and some of the more tragic residents, but the rooms he draws our attention to are a shortcut. Basically, here's where you might detect some activity. Instead, I go in whatever room that looks creepiest, stay in the middle, and think, yep, that's creepy, and then move on. At one point, we're in the hallway, and I hear a loud beeping from somewhere else on the floor. A beeping that I never heard in person. Is that a REM pod? I ask out loud. A REM pod is a small cylindrical device with an antenna sticking from the top, surrounded by a ring of lights. It detects ambient temperature changes and electromagnetism. I've seen them on reality TV, but never in person. When it's time for all of us to get together, Ryan and I set up near the doorway of a room previously belonging to two men, Frank and Larry. Mm. The floor of the room has offerings to the residents, playing cards, cigarettes, poker chips. Ryan turns the REM pod on and the 12 of us sit 20 to 30 feet away, facing each other across the hallway. Ryan puts the flashlight in the middle of the floor. A ghost might be able to move it or cause it to flicker. He begins to ask questions. At first, one of the smoke and grannies answers <laughs> until she's shushed by her companion. The thing about having the gear is you do tend to get results, which is pretty cool. While the entire building is perfect for feeling spooked or for interpreting any movement of air as a hand on the back of the neck, it's another thing entirely to hear a man ask questions and get a response out of the darkness, an invisible intelligence yards away. When Ryan asks Frank and Larry to come out of the room with a REM, the REM pod starts beeping loudly and continuously until Ryan politely asks them to step away. At another point, as the flashlight flickers untouched, we all feel a cool breeze move down the hallway. When our two hours on the fourth floor are up, we move down to the first. The smoking grannies have teamed up with the teenage girls from our group to conduct a spirit box session in the room of the young girls who died in the asylum. A spirit box is a handheld device that scans radio frequencies looking for static between stations in the hope that spirits could drop words in that static and responses to specific questions. One of the girls listens to the spirit box through headphones so she can't hear the grannies' questions and provides unbiased answers. Pause between the questions and answers are long and the white noise can kind of be hypnotizing. Some words seem to pop out at random but a couple times we did receive coherent answers, a brief interview that amounted to, please leave me alone. Nevertheless, one of the grannies continued to ask if the spirit wants to play, My if God. she wants to talk, if she likes us and wants to be our friend. Ryan takes us past the room of another young girl, someone nine or 10 years old when she died. As in others children's rooms, there's a bunch of toys, offerings for her spirit. And there's two balloons, a pink and a blue, inflated but resting on the floor. Ryan shines his flashlight into the room and asks the spirit if she wants to play with her balloons. The pink rocks in response. The pink one today, Ryan asks. Usually it's the blue one. 
the pink balloon bobs a little bit more. Later, my husband walked past the room, sure that maybe our movements disturbed the air and that's what caused the balloons to rock again. But still, they were too far away from the doorway to be affected by activity outside. This is our last mediated encounter, less flashy than the REM pod, the spirit box. A lot of ghost hunting I've learned is like this. Hundreds of empty rooms, one in which you get a little something you can't explain, a word or a movement, and over time, these events construct a narrative. So... Very traditional, yeah. Like nothing larger than life. It doesn't feel like a creative fiction on Reddit. <laughs> uh, it's it's kind of. Uh, I feel like you'd leave feeling like I captured something, without it being like life changing. So that said, what are your thoughts on that story? While I drink coffee and not die, uh, it's it's nice. It's it's realistic. It's realistic on like a real ghost hunting thing. It's cool that they got some responses, like the the ghost the balloon i'm doing this motion the balloon uh but it's not crazy over the top and that's always nice too because it makes it more believable in some ways you know yeah i I love a story that doesn't blow me away because i find it more believable than like something where you know the world explodes uh you said the windows were painted shut though that's what they said on the fourth floor because we we saw the windows that wasn't this story that was the reddit story Okay. I'm it's hard. Saying. It's easy to get them confused because there is like 30 minutes ago that we you said, said that one. I saw it. I hope I hope the audio and the video is working well for you guys. Right now, I think we're okay. So we're going to move what? on. And reminder, we are Sean of the Dead. <laughs> if you, for anyone new that can't tell. I need a cigarette. So now we're going to move on to Audrey's experience. So again, Audrey is our friend. Uh, she lives in Colorado. She has her own investigation uh, paranormal team. And she actually went to the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. So this is her story that I asked her to write to us, and she was very kind and generous to share with us. Quote, I've been to the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum twice. The first time was in June of 2021. We made the decision to drive there, which is 50 hours round trip from Colorado. Driving that long is definitely not something I'd recommend, but it was absolutely worth it in the end. We made it to West Virginia late in the evening, the two days uh, of our investigation. Even though our Airbnb was the next town over, we wanted to stop and get our first view of the asylum immediately. This was a bucket list spot for all of us there, eight in total. And eight who, people in a car for 50 hours? Yeah, who had been paranormal investigators for some time now. All right, so well, we'll skip to day three since it's been going on for a little bit. So day three was the big day. We were going to investigate. Driving up to the building at 8 p.m., it was just as beautiful as the first moment we saw it. Our guide let us set up in the breakout room, putting our equipment and making our game plans, but really, we just wanted to get out there. It should also be said that the town of Weston used to have what I can only describe as a Silent Hill siren that would go off at 10 p.m. every night to signal curfew. When you're walking through the halls of an abandoned asylum in the, that pitch black and that siren starts going off, that's a new level of what the hell is going on and get me the hell out of here. You got to switch your sidearm at that point. Yeah, that's... <laughs> you press R1? <laughs> yes. It was still in action the first year I went, but it's since been turned off, which we are not in Weston. So we, well, we it's turned off, but we wouldn't have experienced that anyways. The craziest experience that I had was on the first floor, in what I think is Ward 4, if I'm remembering correctly, just past the historically preserved section, but before the Civil War section. I was with two other investigators sitting in Lily's room. Lily is allegedly a child spirit that resides in the asylum. We didn't get much interaction with her, but what happened out in the hallway is something that still sticks with me to this day. We started hearing tapping in the hallway. So one of the investigators stepped in the hallways to see if we could do a call and response test. This method allows you to knock and ask the spirit to mirror it or make a request verbally and see if the entity can complete the request. Regardless of the amount of knocks, if she asked for whatever was out there communicated back. If she asked for two knocks, we got two knocks. If she asked for four, we got four. If she asked for closer, the knocks gradually became closer. You get the picture. It was crazy. Well, that's really terrifying. This was the first hallway we had gone to, and we were already getting this level of activity. So the two of us left Lily's room, stepped out. The two of us left in Lily's room, stepped out, leaving our bags of equipment in the room, and made our way into the dark hallway. 
it seemed to stretch out forever before us, full of promising evidence. You could feel the energy out there. I've always been pretty sensitive to the paranormal, and you could feel the weight shift between Lily's room and that of the random hallway. Sometimes when you chart, change the environment of an experiment in the paranormal, you lose the energy you had before. Something as small as inserting one more person or one more piece of equipment can make those amazing results you were getting disappear. Thankfully, that didn't happen for us. We kept hearing the knocking sounds. Now to explain what happened next, I have to explain a little more about the layout of the asylum. At the end of most halls, like the one we were in, is a nurse's station. It's got a counter that's just over hip height, and the nurses would be out behind it during their shifts. We were standing right in front of that with the door to Lily's room to our right, and we started hearing rustling coming from the nurse's station. Now I'll be honest, my gut instinct was to be more worried about an animal inside the station than anything paranormal. If you ever go on an investigation with me, I always say I'm way more worried about the living than I am about the dead. And this was the same case here. I had no interest in coming face to face with some badger or raccoon that had snuck their way into the building. We all turned around to face the station and I lifted my flashlight, shining it inside to see nothing and then something small came flying out. It arched, tiny and red through the air, landing at our feet. I might have screamed, I'm honestly not sure. We all immediately looked down to find a tiny red piece of plastic. A familiar piece of plastic. Something had just thrown the cap from one of our investigator's emergency lights out of the nurse's station. Her emergency lights were still zipped safely inside of her bag, inside of Lily's room. We had all seen it come flying out. Even if she happened to have her light with her at the time, there was physically no way it could have come from within the nurse's station. It was the shock of a lifetime. It was probably one of the best pieces of evidence I've ever seen. And unfortunately, we didn't have it on camera. Because, of course, we didn't have it on camera. It always seems the best evidence is seen with only the eyes and never on footage. When I went back earlier this year, I had an experience in the same hallway. I was sitting in the opposite end with my friend and my podcast co-host, Bex, staring down at the nurse's station and telling her the story of what happened, what I experienced last time when I was in the hallway. I was interested to see if we could replicate any of the same experiences or if anything there remembered me from the last time I visited. Out of nowhere, while we were the only ones in this wing of the hospital, a door slammed, loud and metallic. It rattled the space around us. Whatever I had been asking about, wondering if they recognized me from last time I had visited, appeared to give us a resounding yes in response. While those were definitely my biggest experiences while I was there, I also got whistled at by a ghost on the fourth floor, had my name whispered over several EVPs, even shadow figures walking across hallways, and was dive-bombed by more than one bat through my times there. Guides have whispered tales about being grabbed, seeing not deer on the property, and even a large ghost dog. The asylum is a special place. While I've only been there twice, I'm literally dying to go back. Every time, it's something unique, something different. There's stories out there about calling and hoping for some lucky investigator to answer. And that's my short version of the asylum experiences. I feel like I could talk about it forever. It's incredible there, and I would go back in a heartbeat. That's intense. That's an intense investigation. Well, the audio is good. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around. I know this has been uh, a little bit of a hassle of a, of a night. But with that said, we are getting to our third and final trivia question. We've already done two. This third trivia question is for a hoodie. And this is multiple choice, but you got you to gotta answer all of them. And I'll, I'll pass the mic over. You right. can't see me, but I'm handing it over to you, Charlie. All right. So the third question, you have to name, you have to name four. So the question is, name four interviews that we have conducted on the podcast this year. There are more than four answers. So do your best. I think there's six. I think there's six answers there's and six we just need well. four. Can you imagine a ghost saying your name in EVP? Uh Hopefully it said Perry and I would just blame it on Parker. Could you could you see a not deer? Like could you imagine seeing a not deer on the land? No, uh, I no. That would be I mean it'd be one like you're expecting to see ghosts in an asylum oh and then God. instead you see a not deer. That'd be so scary. That'd be so scary. Could, oh, you, you see this deer walking through the woods, right? And then it opens from the middle and that's what the teeth are. I like the imagery of the not deer a lot. 
Anyone got any guess? We might be super behind. Uh, I don't think we are. I think we're okay. It you just think there's no guesses? <laughs> uh, it, yeah. <laughs> it's been going pretty well. Nat Alley, George Cogill, Linz Cummins. Yep. Yep. You got it. Is it Ash Claps? Ash, Ash Chaps? Claps. Ash Chaps? Ash Chaps? Is it C- it's Ash Chaps. Ash Chaps. Yes. Ash Chaps. Nice job. You get, hit us up. You get a BTB hoodie. Thank you, everybody else that's commented, though. We, yeah, we've been trying so to inter- we've been trying yeah. to do these interview things, and it's been fun. So now we'll do a little bit of abbreviated because of the the audio where where we're at with everything. Video. We'll do a little bit of abbreviated discussion here. So yeah. Charlie, give us your thoughts on the tour. Give us your thoughts on the special ghosts, on and whether or not you find this place haunted. So I really enjoy the tour a lot. It was a lot of fun to do. I'm glad we got to go on the tour. It was mid midday. It was two o'clock in the afternoon when we went. I didn't feel the pressure. And <laughs> uh, we were a little invested in the football game, but I didn't feel any kind of like, I wish I would have, something would have happened besides the creepy college girl that was poking around every, every, uh, corner I was going. I swear, every time I saw like an empty room, this girl poked her head in. Uh, and there was one room where I was talking to myself. I was like trying to get the ghost to like do something. And she poked her head in and I looked crazy. I want to be like, no, I'm not crazy. I, I just was talking to the ghost. She probably would have understood because it was a paranormal tour, right? But it was still awkward. I, I wish I would have felt something here more strongly than, than I did. I wanted, I wanted to leave there with like a scratch or something. I wanted to leave and be like, guys, look at this thing on my arm. It's obviously haunted. I wanted, I wanted that nail in the coffin for me because I haven't had that in such a long time. I wanted that. And so I was a little disappointed I didn't get that. But I do think it is overall pretty spooky. Like so many bad things have happened there. And we've talked about in the past, like when, when things like this leave a mark, trauma leaves a mark in the, in the facility. And it, it almost acts like a recording in a way. And I do think that this trauma that happened here, all those people stuffed in there, all those lobotomies happening, those terrible experiments what are happening. What your thoughts people. on lobotomies? Like, do they freak you out as much as they freak me out? I mean, no. I think it's a very interesting topic. I think it's terrible that they happen. But I do think it's, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, get to me. You know what gets to me? Teeth stuff. Is there anything about this place that you, like, is there any reason why you wouldn't find this place haunted? Well, uh, so many people have had experiences here, but I, I didn't. Like I was saying earlier, it was, it's hard. It's hard because, oh, hello, I'm back. It's hard because I was teching on the fly, y'all. It was, it was pretty good. Whew. But I, I didn't feel that like pressure myself. No, but we also weren't ghost hunting. We were just there. That's that's all. I was just answering your question. So I'm saying I didn't feel it. No, but okay. Sorry. Let's pretend. But I mean, most of these places we never even physically go to. Yeah. Like if we didn't go there and we did the story, I feel like you'd be like, and I'd be like, haunted obviously haunted so you didn't feel anything but you heard the stories yeah audrey told us her story reddit experiences our tour guide is there any reason for you to believe that this that these aren't true and that it's not a haunted location absolutely not i i think i was gonna yeah absolutely not the the people especially yeah a lot of respect for audrey and and like imagine you're in the dark and something that was in a different room zipped up in a bag comes flying at you yeah like that would just like the shivers i mean the knocking thing would be crazy too and saying her name in multiple places and they remembered her they remembered her they opened the door and slammed it yeah uh creepy creepy experiences as you guys know charlie and i already believe in ghosts out of some things he believes in some things i believe in ghosts ghosts and aliens those are our biggest overlap that's for sure we definitely believe in both I agree with Charlie. When we were there, I wasn't getting any feelings. Maybe because I had like two Advil and five <laughs> Zycam. And you were too. Uh... I was somewhere else. I, I actually, I'm not gonna lie. This I, there was a moment. It was uh It was one of the rooms I went in. I don't know if it was the children's floor. There was a floor, and I I I had tunnel vision. My legs weren't. I wasn't. I didn't feel like I was in control. My legs. I just like walked to a window and I stood there like this and I took a picture and I I could just feel 
that I was so out of my mind because of all the medication I was on. Yeah. And I'm like, thank God we're not leaving right now because I would not be able to drive. Man. That was my experience. That's that's so crazy. That almost sounds like a possession. Yeah. Well, you know what? Yeah, I didn't think about that, but I knew it wasn't that. I was not being affected by the asylum. I was being affected by Zycam and <laughs> Advil and I was, the little lozenges. It was such a bummer getting so sick yesterday. So yeah. But yeah, the video's back. I, I I put a new camera up there. We have two cameras, and and I I thought all the we batteries should, were dead, uh, but I wanted to check. Yeah, so it might not last too long. But well, no, the the battery power should be good. I I wish I would have got it sooner, but I was yeah. mid story. So, mm-hmm. uh, but that's it. I, I I vote believable. I think this place is haunted. Uh, I vote believable. You, as well. We get the background. We get the tragedy. We understand why it might be haunted. You get the special infected, the creeper, yeah, Lily in her room, the guy that was when. That moment I looked at you and it was about the kid getting shanked. Yeah. I thought it, she was going to talk about the guys the smashing. Best. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's why I looked at you. I was like, this is going to be pretty crazy. And then it yeah. wasn't that street. It was, it was still, still cra- pretty crazy. Pretty. Yeah. Still a crazy story. I mean, there's so many stories. You know, uh, what, you know, what's weird about that too. She said, she said, the boys don't mind if you talk about it in the hallway, but if you go into the room and talk about it, it bathroom. shuts them down. Yeah, and then you had a good theory. You're like, well, what if people do that on tours and that just ruins it for the rest of the day? Yeah, like someone does it like the 10 o'clock tour and like they come back for the evening flashlight and just kills it. Yes. Which I don't think we anyone explained it. You know what the flashlight thing is? Like they're talking about the flashlight thing is it's like you leave the flashlight on the on the windowsill, right? Yeah. And you unscrew the back enough where the battery has to be touched oh. to go off. Okay. And that's what they're doing on those tours i i it says uh, please do this again sooner than later we got to get some shit figured out <laughs> before we do this like i'm okay being very transparent with you guys lives stress me out being sick on top of a lie stresses me out being sick on a live with shoddy web with uh wi-fi is even more. and this is the but, week from hell from you too this is just yeah a, this whole week's been, been a rough week but, I feel you know there's something about i i feel like when you have a tie on and a button-up shirt, collared shirt. <laughs> like I do feel like I'm presenting right now, which is pretty fun. I do feel like a swag again. Kid. Shout out to this this stand. I love this stand because you know I don't know if how many of y'all remember this, but our first few live episodes we had paper. Oh, we were, yeah, we, we did. were like this, and like you could see the flipping in the heard woods, the f- in the Ohio woods. Yeah, because we used to do I think Facebook and Instagram lives before we were doing Twitch here. But well, that is our episode on the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. I'm super pumped that we were able to go there, and the Trisha will be alive. We might be more prepared next year. I'm hoping we will be with this stuff. But we're going to be traveling again next year for that. It's, it'll be Charlie's year, yeah, which means I can kind of like you know, I had a good time this year. But... We we get that every other like last year Gettysburg was all Charlie. I got so nervous. I got sick last time. So and I got so sick that I got nervous this time. So, <laughs> but hey. I really want to say that I appreciate you guys sticking with us through all the possession of Sidaikam. That's funny. I appreciate that you guys stick with us through all the the glitches. I hope you enjoyed the stories. I know it might be a little bit fragmented. Yeah. So I hope you were able to take away some of the entertainment and the if creepiness. You, if of, you do listen on Tuesday, it'll hopefully it'll be a little bit more. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Come back on Tuesday and and we'll see how well. The main episode. Yeah, we'll see. I should be able to congeal it together we'll a little we'll bit. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. But we appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for sticking with us. We hope you enjoyed the episode. We both go believable because obviously this place is haunted. That's just fact. It's just true. Uh, but thank you guys so much. Have a great evening. Have a happy Halloween. We are Sean and what's his name? What's his name? Ed. And Sean and Ed. Sean and Ed from Sean of the Dead. Have a great evening and Halloween. We appreciate you guys. So, As always. I'm, I'm Tyler. And I'm Charlie. And thanks for listening to Believing the Bazaar. He re- replicated it. Oh, don't hiss with the super bad. Is is the audio super bad or is the video super bad? Audio or video? Someone said audio earlier, but that was one person. All right. I, we see the super bad. We see you. We feel you. <laughs> uh, please let us know if it's just audio or if it's just video, if it's both audio and video. Which I'm doing wrong. We don't want either. Yeah, but if, uh, you know. Uh-oh, pause.